Hello and welcome to Broom Hall. We are Charles and Cherie Bruce and we're delighted that you have chosen to come and visit our house on your Viking tour. This has been the seat of the Bruce family for over 300 years, but the family came to Scotland over 900 years ago. And what you'll be seeing is Scottish history, British history, and world history. We've been a family of warriors, of statesmen, of explorers, of writers, and all the original material which we have accumulated over the centuries is available to be seen on the tour today. We invite you to join us now for a taster of what you may experience when you come to Broomhall House for a tour, where you'll hear fascinating stories and see objects never to be seen anywhere else in the world. This is an early map of North America which shows the entire eastern seaboard from the Gulf of St. Lawrence to the Gulf of Mexico. It doesn't indicate any states and there is no boundary between Canada and the United States. It indicates how the Ohio River system was mapped for the first time, but it's centered on Chesapeake Bay and Virginia. And that's the connection with Scotland because that created Scotland's wealth in the mid 18th century. We imported huge quantities of tobacco from Virginia and processed it on the Clyde at uh, Greenock and Port Glasgow. So by the time of the American Revolution in the 1770s, Scotland was actually producing half of all the tobacco consumed in Europe, which was about 80% of our exports by value. And that provided the working capital that was invested widely in the Scottish economy that produced one of the fastest growing economies of the time and provided all the raw material to Adam Smith, the uh, professor of philosophy from Glasgow University, who wrote the world's first economic treatise, the inquiry into the cause of the wealth of nations. And I think that really indicates how strongly the connection between Scotland and North America emerges at, in the period before the American Revolution. And as I said earlier, how that connection is continued through the intellectual endeavor of the Scottish writers. So did the Bruce's support Bonnie Prince Charlie in the 45 Rebellion? Well, it's a very interesting story. We did support the Jacobites, but we <laughs> didn't seem to support Bonnie Prince Charlie. I have on the desk here, alongside this map, a book written by Bonnie Prince Charlie's uncle. And we have other memorabilia in the house from that period. But the most interesting book of all, which is also on the desk here, is a 1745 copy of the Scots magazine, which is uh, a periodical still in print. And that belonged to a member of the family, a lady called Janet Bruce, who was pretty much in charge of the family at that time. And she kept the family out of the Jacobite rebellion because she realized that the risk of losing uh, was simply too great for a family like ours to countenance because we would have lost everything. We would have had all our land, all the books in this library, everything would have been seized. And using a woman's intuition, she decided on the safest course, which is the one that she adopted. But when the Jacobite rebellion was over, Janet and other women in Scotland who were well-placed resettled families or, uh, from all over Scotland who'd lost their livelihoods because their landlords may have been Jacobites and their, those estates would have been seized by the Hanoverian forces. I have here a ledger from many years later. This is from 1826, 80 years after the Jacobite Rebellion, but the history is still relevant because what this indicates is that families came to live on the estate, escaping uh, the, the turmoil of the period, like economic refugees, and one of those family uh, that came to stay here were called Carnegie. So this is a handwritten ledger from 1826 and clearly indicates the name Andrew Carnegie, late tenant, uh, owing the sum of 34 pounds and 10 shillings and the clerk in the estate office for good measure has added a bit more, claiming that these were desperate and doubtful debts, the arrears of house rent, and that the Carnegies were very poor and unable to pay anything.
The family left the estate at this time, they moved to Dunfermline, and 20 years later they leave Scotland altogether and they emigrate to the United States. They go to Pittsburgh. And to cut a long story short, they take with them a young boy bearing the same name as his grandfather, whose name appears in this ledger, Andrew Carnegie. 1901, Andrew Carnegie sells his business, a steel-making business, to J.P. Morgan for $408 million, $15 billion in today's values, which is probably the most extreme rags to riches story from this period of history, and yet again indicates this very close connection between Scotland and the United States. And Tolstoy, we have any other archives in the library that demonstrate the impact on world history? Yes, indeed, we do. We, let's move over here and have a look. So what we have laid out on the piano here are original state documents which have come into the hands of the Bruce family <laughs> simply because members of the family were appointed by successive governments of Queen Victoria, whose silver effigy is behind me here, as ministers plenipotentiary or ambassadors representing Britain around the world. And in the mid-19th century, Britain attempted to establish a series of treaties to promote free trade. And what we have here is a treaty signed with China in 1858 in Tianjin. I believe it is only one of two copies, the other is in the Foreign Office. So it's quite unusual to have a state document like this in private hands. So this is the signing page of the treaty, which clearly indicates the seal of the Chinese emperor in vermilion ink, uh, probably a large block of jade, which is affixed to the signing page. And on behalf of Queen Victoria, my ancestor, James Bruce, Earl of Elgin and Kincardine, has signed his own name in ink and affixed his own seal. Very unusually, we also have correspondence from Queen Victoria to the Qing Emperor. Two letters, in fact, which would have been sent up to Peking after the treaty was signed, when it was being uh, sent to be ratified, but they were returned unopened because a Chinese emperor would not normally expect to receive a letter from a mere Queen of Great Britain, considering himself to be on a much higher plane of existence. So the letters were politely returned and not opened, and they have yet to be opened. The seal is unbroken, so the mystery continues. A library like this represents the time in world history when knowledge becomes understanding, and that is very much what is happening in Scotland in the mid 18th century, at the time of the American Revolution, leading up to the Declaration of Independence. And it's a surprising fact, nonetheless, half of the signatories were either born in Scotland and had emigrated, or born of Scottish parents who'd emigrated, or more typically had been educated by Scottish academics at universities like Princeton and the College of William and Mary. And it's interesting, for instance, that Thomas Jefferson, who attended the College of William and Mary in Virginia, recognized that the most important influence on him during his time at university was a Scottish academic, Professor Small from Aberdeen. In fact, he said, I learned more from Professor Small than anyone else. When Jefferson gave his library to Congress to form the Library of Congress, it would have contained many of the books which are on the shelves behind me, including, for example, the first edition of The Theory of Moral Sentiments, a book written by the Scottish philosopher Adam Smith in 1759. Uh, Adam Smith wrote only two books, uh, that and the inquiry into the cause of the wealth of nations, but those books very much represented uh, the most advanced thinking of the time of how to create a modern state. So if you like, the formation of the United States was intellectually very soundly based on ideas that had emerged from Scotland at that time by writers whose books are in this library here today.
Charles, can you tell us about the architectural story um, of the house? And, and is there a connection between Broom Hall and the White House in Washington, D.C.? Absolutely. I have all the architectural plans and elevations laid out in here. Can we take a closer look? Yes, they're right here. These are drawings of the house at the end of the 18th century. There had been a house in 1766 built by John Adam. And at the end of the century, they decided to rebuild the house. So they employed an architect from Chester in the northwest of England. And he provides a suite of drawings, which are kept in this portfolio here, of a neoclassical elevation. And they've chosen this one. So they add a new south elevation to the 1766 house, which is virtually contemporary with the White House in Washington, D.C., which had been finished two years before in 1794. These are from 1796. But the really interesting thing is that it's not just an architectural connection. The building materials for the White House also come from this estate. Because when they came to build the house, they realized they didn't have sufficient caliber of stonemasons um, in the United States. So the Scottish clerk of works, Mr. Williamson, recruits the stonemasons in Edinburgh. And they cross the Atlantic carrying their building tools and their essential building supplies, which principally was lime mortar for making the building mortar for, for, the, for the construction of the White House. So it's not just an architectural connection, it's also a material connection between the lime works on this estate um, and the finished uh, building in Washington. It's a lovely room and I've noticed there's um, some beautiful old masters in this room. What can you tell us about those? Well, the collection was formed in Paris at the beginning of the 19th century. The ancestor who makes a collection has been a British ambassador who was arrested by Napoleon and had spent three years as a prisoner of Napoleon. And when he's released on parole, he makes a collection of old masters, mostly Italian old masters, but we have some French paintings too, including a painting from the Fontainebleau School, which is the early 16th century, late 15th century French school of art. And that painting is just above the door here. Can we take a closer look? Yes, let's go and have a look. So this is the Fontainebleau painting I was telling you about, the French school of painting, late 15th, early 16th century. The picture shows three figures, a woman and two men. The idea is that she's supposed to be choosing between youth and wisdom, but we're not supposed to know who she decides to choose as her partner. And in fact, gratuitously, she's passing to the older gentleman his reading glasses so that he can see her more clearly. It's a wonderful story. Do we have any other paintings of the same era in here? Yes, indeed. We have a painting from 1517, well, at least a copy, by the artist Raphael, which is just over there between the windows. So this is a late 18th century copy of a very important picture from the early Renaissance, which was the famous portrait of Joanna of Naples, a Spanish princess, by the Renaissance painter Raphael, assisted in this case by his pupil Giulio Romano. And the story really is that Joanna was supposed to have been the most beautiful woman in Europe. So people wanted to know why. <laughs> and the painting was commissioned by a French king uh, and widely copied at the time that it was painted in 1517. The interesting thing is that this painting by Giulio Romano of Joanna is almost contemporary with Leonardo's masterpiece the Mona Lisa, but clearly there are very different depictions of femininity. Uh, this clearly is a painting of a very beautiful woman who was supposed to have had the longest neck in Europe. And I think the painter has taken a bit of a liberty with that and have, has extended her neck to make it almost anatomically <laughs> impossible. But she was always fending off unwanted attention. The King of England, Henry VII, who had lost his wife, sends an ambassador to Naples to check her out, carrying with him the 16th century equivalent of a clipboard, if such a thing existed, with a long list of questions which had to be answered, much to the irritation of Joanna's family. One of the questions was, does she have hair on her upper lip? Another was, what is the colour of her teeth? 
And then critically, they wanted to know if she had a very long neck. So I imagine he, he ticked that box. Do we have any other connections with the European royal family? Yes, in the dining room. Can we see them? Indeed, let's go there now. This is a 14th century double-handed sword that's been in the family for about 30 generations. We believed it belonged to Robert the Bruce, um, and it was given by his surviving son, David II, to a kinsman at Clack Manor in order for the legacy of the family having the crown of Scotland for two generations would be continued. Um, and it's been passed from father to son until that time. What we have here is a skull of the king. This is a plaster cast. His body was found in Dunfermline Abbey in 1818 and a cast was taken. I believe there are about six of these have survived. The story of how the king's body was found is really quite extraordinary. It happened within a week or so of all the crown jewels of Scotland being <laughs> discovered in a cupboard in Edinburgh Castle. So two incredible discoveries happened at the beginning of that year. And the king's body was then reburied in Dunfermline Abbey um, under an, an extraordinary uh, pulpit and a slab of, of porphyry. And there it stays to this day. What we have over here is a heraldic impression of the king on horseback at the Battle of Bannockburn, the famous battle which he won in 1314. The king's favorite weapon actually was the battle axe. It wasn't a two-handed sword. And the sword really probably is a sword of state. It has a, had had a ceremonial purpose. But with the battle axe, famously, he killed the knight Sir Henry de Boone, who was charging at him on the first day of the battle. And his men said to him afterwards, reprimanding him for risking his life, that he could have been killed. And all he said was, I lost my good axe. Giles, that's a wonderful fireplace. I've heard it was once a bed, is this true? Yes, a four poster bed, a royal marriage bed. Would you like to have a closer look? Yes, I would. So this fireplace has been made up from pieces of a four poster bed, which was a marriage bed, accompanying a Danish princess who had married a Scottish king in 1590, Anne of Denmark, who married James VI. And she was given as her diary on marriage, the Palace of Dunfermline, and that's where the bed was kept. When the royal family left Scotland on the death of Elizabeth I in 1603, they, I, I guess they left their furniture behind. And ultimately this bed had made its way into a coaching inn um, in the best bedroom. So you could pay a little bit extra to sleep in a royal bed. And ultimately, I think we bought it from an antique store and the estate carpenter made it up into a mantelpiece. Um, clearly, it has carved figures which would have formed the posts holding the bed and each is sitting on a lion's head, which indicates it was a royal marriage bed. What can you tell us about the tapestry above the fireplace? The tapestry is a needlepoint, uh, early 18th century, which was completed by ladies of the house. So it's very much a work that was completed when the house was built by people who lived here. Charles, have any royal visitors been entertained here? Yes, several over the years. We believe that Queen Victoria's mother stayed for a while in the mid 19th century. And then in 1923, there was a visit by King George V and Queen Mary who came for lunch. My grandparents who were entertaining them had only recently married and it was the first important bit of entertaining they had to undertake and unfortunately it was like uh, there were a series of near disasters one was that they forgot the queen smoked and out of desperation they sent a telegram to london to the royal tobacconists and cigarettes were put on the night train and collected uh, that morning the queen was offered a cigarette after lunch and then they discovered there were no ashtrays then the party moved outside for a photograph which included King George V, King George, the future King George VI, Queen Mary, and the future Queen Elizabeth, who would be the next uh, queen, queen Mother, um, my grandparents entertaining. The interesting thing is that the photographer, the local photographer, was actually the Provost of Dunfermline. So he had to be in the photograph. So the photograph was being taken by his assistant, who was a bit nervous. He'd never taken a photograph of such an important group of people in his life before. And clearly nothing was actually happening. Everyone was standing, no photograph was being taken. So in exasperation, the provost calls out to his assistant, what's taking you so long? 
And the assistant throws back the black cover, which is covering him as he's taking the photograph, and points at the king, at King George V, and says, if the wee man with a beard would just stand still, we'll get this done fine. And then there was apparently a moment's silence, my grandmother told me the story, and everyone collapsed in laughter because this was such an unlikely <laughs> exchange to have taken place. But clearly the photographer had never seen the king before, except maybe on a postage stamp, so he had no idea who he was talking to. But there was, uh, what was going on here clearly was a slightly problematic marriage between Queen Mary, Queen Mary and King George, um, because my grandmother said she'd never seen the queen laugh so much. And after that, they all went up to Dunfermline and had the first royal walkabout, um, because everyone was in such a good frame of mind. And what else can you show us um, that's connected to any royal visits? Well, we have more royal artefacts. Um, there's a, a fantastic flag hanging up in the gong hall, which I can show you. Yes, OK. So this is a flag that represents the Lord of Tenant, who's the king's representative of Fife. It has a crown and a sword over the uh, Union flag. And it flew over the house because my grandfather was the Lord of Tenant on the outbreak of war in 1939, when we declared war on Germany. At the beginning of the Second World War, not very much happened, and it was known as the Phony War. But very unexpectedly, about six weeks after the outbreak of war, three waves of enemy bombers were seen in the sky approaching the house over the river. There were no air raid warnings or air raid shelters built at that time, and the family went down into the cellar very quickly, which would have given them a certain amount of protection if the house was going to be hit. But my grandfather marched out to the end of the lawn to see what on earth was going on uh, with my father, who is still alive at 99. He was a boy of 15. And my grandfather took one look at the Heinkel bombers approaching the house and said to my father, go and get the rifle. So my father runs back to the house, collects his sporting rifle and returns with a full clip of uh, bullets in the magazine. And my grandfather proceeds to shoot at the German planes. Charles, is that um, a bust of Queen Victoria? Yes, this is Queen Victoria. Oh. Cur curiously uh, depicted by her daughter, Louisa, uh, who was a very gifted sculptress. The portrait bust was a present to my great-grandfather in 1870 when he came of age, when he had his 21st birthday. Queen Victoria was his godmother, and in fact the family had chosen the male version of her name. So he was Victor, the ninth Earl of Elgin. Uh, Victoria uh, had lost her husband and her mother about nine years before in the course of, of about nine months. And the person who managed to kind of put her back on the rails after this period of great grief and bereavement was another member of the family, Augusta Bruce, who was a close confidant of the Queen and served as her woman of the bedchamber. So there's been a, a close connection with Queen Victoria probably for over a period of 50 years with various members of the family serving her in different offices. In this part of the house, in fact, we have got quite a few portrait busts and there's another one which we're going to have a look at, which is the most recent. It's from 1964. This looks like a bust of King Robert the Bruce. Yes, indeed. My father raised the funds to build a new equestrian statue of the king at Bannockburn to commemorate the 650th anniversary of the famous battle when King Robert's army destroyed the army of Edward II. The actual unveiling was done by the Queen, and it was my first childhood memory as a boy of three. The Queen came up and unveiled the equestrian statue. And afterwards, the sculptor, Pilton Jackson, gave us a copy of the King's uh, bust, uh, this maquette in plaster. But curiously enough, it was probably the most accurate portrait of the King that had been made up to that point because the sculptor took to the forensic laboratory at Strathclyde Police the um, skull, which we have, the, the cast of the skull, and they showed him how to form a face from a skull. So he had the king sitting on his charger, staring out across the field of Bannyburn, watching the English army approaching in the distance. So we hope you've enjoyed the introduction to Broomhall House today. But we've only been able to show you a fraction of what there is to see here. We look forward to welcoming you to Scotland and to Broomhall House on your next Viking cruise. Bye.